I hesitate to criticize Dad because what sanity I have I owe to his loving kindness. But there's no doubt that he did pamper me, and such early coddling was one of one of the reasons I embarked on a wussy lifestyle. Throughout my schoolboy days, I never felt very manly or strong or viral or vigorous or healthily aggressive. At school, I avoided playground games because I didn't understand why anyone would want to behave like that. I, I love ball games, but was always appalled about how rough, for example, rugby looked, even at the safe distance I kept while pretending to play it. When I was 17, my assistant Clifton College housemaster, Alec McDonald, finally took me to task for bunking tackles, describing my efforts as dancing around in a, like a disabled fairy. He ordered me to watch while he gave a demonstration of how to tackle properly. He asked a member of the first XV, Tony Rogers, to run at him. He closed in on Rogers and then went in hard just as Rogers tried to sidestep him. The result was that the top of Mr. McDonald's head came into sharp contact with Roger's right hip. Mr. McDonald was unavailable for teaching later that afternoon. Indeed, he did not reappear for 48 hours. When he did, I was too cowardly to remind him that he had specifically told me that if you go in hard, you never get hurt. So, when I see international rugby teams lumbering out at Twickenham, I look at them and in awe, but also with a sense of being genetically disconnected from them. I was not born to be to be butch, and I have accepted my in it un unmanliness, unmanliness without complaint. Besides, it seems to me that coward very, cowards very seldom cause trouble, which is probably why there is a history of them being shot by people who do. None of this, incidentally, is to say that my infant wussiness was in any way admirable. But while I was undeniably a gutless little weed, there was was an upside. At least I didn't display the habitual mindless aggression of some young males. Better a wuss than a psycho, I say, and I am proud that I have never been able to force myself to watch cage fighting. If part of my weedy outlook on life came from my father's pampering a fair proportion was down to my complicated relationship with my mother. And in this context, an another early memory comes to mind. I am lying in bed, falling asleep, when a noise causes me to turn and see shadows moving on a half-open door of my bedroom. There are shadows of my parents fighting. Dad has been coming into my room, and Mom has started attacking him, pummeling him with the most perceptive definition of a coward is Ambrose Bierce's. One in one who in a perilous emergency thinks with his legs. This trait seems to me such a wise response to danger that explains why generals want cowards dead. If they weren't, the concept of just plain running away would catch on so fast that the top brace, brass 
would be out of a job overnight, or at least. We have to do some fighting themselves, which is not part of their job description. A flurry of blows, with which he is trying to fend off. There is no sound. I sense they are both trying to not, try not to wake me, and the memory has no emotion attached, although it is very clear. Just the shadows, which last a few seconds, and then silence. As I write this, my throat tightens a little. The level of violence I'm describing is low. There are no salas or chainsaws here, just lower middle class pistocops with no prospect of grievous bodily harm as English laws the English law calls it. Nevertheless, my beloved dad, a kind and decent person, is being attacked by this unknowable creature who is widely rumored to be my mother. Young children have so little life experience that they inevitably assume that what happens around and to them is the norm. I remember that when my daughter Cynthia was very young, she was surprised to discover that some of her friends' fathers did not work in television. So it would have been hard for me to describe my relationship with my mother in, as problematic because I had no idea what the word motherly convoyed, conveyed to most people. Dad once described to me how during the First World War, he had witnessed a wounded soldier lying in the trench and crying out for his mother. Why on earth would he cry for her, I wondered, when over the years I began to hear friends tell me that their mother was their best friend. Someone with whom they routinely dis discussed their daily life, and to whom they looked for emotional support, I simply thought, how wonderful that must be. People do not think I am lawfully lab labeling her a bad mother. In many ways, she was a good mother. Sometimes a very good mother. In all day-to-day -day matters, she was extremely diligent, preparing good meals, making sure I was properly clothed and shod and warm and dry, keeping the house neat and clean and fiercely protective of me. Under light hyp hypnosis, I once recalled a German, a German air raid with the sound of the bombers not far away and mother throwing herself on top of me under a big kitchen table. If it was a false memory, it's still what she would have done. From a practical point of view, that she was impeccable, but she was also self-obsessed and anxious, and that could make life with her very uncomfortable indeed. A clue to her self-obsession, I always felt, was her extraordinary lack of general knowledge. On one of her visits to London in the late 80s, a salad was prepared for lunch, with contained quail's eggs. She asked what kind of eggs they were, and I explained that they were mole's eggs, and that when we wanted them, we would go up to Hampstead Heath very early in the morning as moles laid them at the entrance to their burrows during the night, collect the eggs, and make sure we ate them the same day before they had time to hatch. She listened with great attention as my family's jaws sagged and said she thought them delicious. Later that day, she caught a Mention of Mary, Queen of Mary, Queen of Scots. She recognized the name and asked me who this was. With my family listening, I pushed the pushed the envelope a little, telling her that Mary was a champion Glaswegian uh, darts player who had been killed in the Blitz. 
What a shame, she said. I was being a bit naughty, of course, but I also wanted to prove to my family the truth of a comment I had made earlier about mother. which they not had accepted on first hearing. I had told them that she had no information about anything that was not going to affect her life directly in the immediate future, and that consequently she possessed no general knowledge. And when I said no general knowledge, I didn't mean very, very little. Naturally, they had thought I was exaggerating. And the reason for this was not that she was unintelligent, but that she lived her life in such a constant state of high, high anxiety, bordering on incipient panic, panic, that she could focus only on the things that might directly affect her. So it goes without saying that she suffered from all the usual phobias, along with a very, along with a few special ones like albinos and people wearing eye patches. But she also cast her net net wider. In fact, I used to joke that she suffered from omnophobia. You name it. She had a morbid dread of it. It's true that I never saw her alarm by a loaf of bread or a cardigan or even a chair, but anything above medium size that could move around a, a bit was a hazard. And any reasonably sound startled her beyond reason. I once compiled a list of events that frightened her, and it was quite comprehensive. Very loud snoring, low flying aircraft, church bells, fire engines, trains, buses, and lorries, thunder, shouting, large cars, most medium-sized cars, noisy small cars, burglar alarms, fireworks, especially crackers, Loud radios, barking dogs, whining, winning horses, nearby silent horses, cows in general, megaphones, sheep, corks coming out of sparkling wine bottles, motorcycles, even very small ones, balloons being popped, vacuum cleaners not being used by her, things being dropped, dinner gongs, Parrot houses, whoopee cushions, chiming doorbells, hammering, bombs, hooters, old-fashioned alarm clocks, pneumatic drill, drills, and hair dryers, even used, even those used by her. In a nutshell, a mother experienced the cosmos as, as a vast, limitless booby trap. Consequently, it was never possible for her really to relax, except perhaps for the times when she sat on the sofa knitting while Dad and I watched television. But even when she was active, knitting away against time. I noticed years ago that when people, myself death definitely ex included, are anxious, they, they tend to buy themselves with irrelevant activities because these distract from and therefore reduce their their actual experience of anxiety. To stay perfectly still is to feel the fear at its maximum intensity. So instead you just you scuttle around doing things as though you are in some mysterious way short of time. Although Mother kept herself busy in countless and pointless ways. It did not elevate her weight worrying. Her, her, her pervading sense that she was keeping 
nameless disasters at bay only by inset incessantly anticipating them and that one that moments lapse in this vigilance would bring them hurt hurtling towards her. I once proposed to Dad that we should purchase a large hamster wheel for her so that she would find it easy to remain active all day in instead of having continual can continually to invent non-essential activities like polishing cans of peas or second cups or sewing borders on hang or sewing borders on handkerchiefs or boiling knitting, knitting needles or weeding the carpets. Her her own approach was to write her to write her worries down write her worries down on a piece of paper so that there was no chance no chance she would forget one. Thus unleashing it thus unleashing it. After Dad died, I would drive down to Weston to visit her, and she would greet me with a cup of coffee and a very long list of worries which she had been compiling during the previous weeks, and we would sit down and discuss each worry in turn at some length. What it was about and why it mattered, and how likely it was to happen, and what she could do to forestall it, and and what we could do if it actually happened, and whether we know what to do if it didn't. <laughs> and after we possessed six or so, she made me another cup of coffee, and we would continue working till bedtime. And if we hadn't got through them all by then, we'd leave the rest for breakfast. It took me decades to realize that it was not the analyzing of her worries that eased them. It was the continuous contact with another person that gradually calmed her. <laughs>